Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Adrian, as, as Martin mentioned. Um, my day job is I work at McKinsey & Company. I'm also a member of the Asia Society's Global Talent and Diversity Council. Um, and at McKinsey, I founded and lead our internal Asian ERG, uh, and also something called the Asian Leadership Academy, which I may have the chance to talk about a little bit later. But um, I'm joined by a fantastic panel today. Um, I think this is the final panel of the day, and then we're going to have the pleasure of hearing from John Wang, my good friend, uh, as we close out the day. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to ask um, our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, the other thing that I'm going to try to do is make this a conversation, and I mean that quite deliberately. I know all of you out there um, are probably going to have questions and that sort of thing. I'm going to try to create an opportunity before we end the session to, to make sure that we can answer a few of those as well. Um, but the session uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to try to cover two things. One is talking about Asian American advancement, the diagnosis of the challenge, what do we see in the research, what are the things we can learn from, from all the organizations that have been doing a ton of really good work in this field. And then the second thing is the solutions. I think between D Justin, uh, Julie, and... Um, and Diana, there's going to be a lot of good conversation around across the different sectors that they represent, interesting learnings that they've seen, and, and you know what great looks like. Um, and then I'm going to do my best along the way to just kind of you know keep the conversation going. All right. Well, with that, maybe we'll start um, at the end, Julie. If you want to introduce yourself, and I, I've been told you have to hit the button. It's like the UN <laughs> <laughs> to speak. But Julie, go ahead. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, I'm Julie Amblazewski, and I have had the pleasure of being the uh, survey administrator for the Asian Corporate Survey since around 2012. Uh, so, had the pleasure again of seeing longitudinal data uh, that we've then uh, incorporated into our annual or now biennial report on uh, the Asian corporate uh, experience, uh, also leading to the awards recognition of certain companies that you'll have the pleasure of uh, uh, learning about uh, later at the awards gala. Um, my background is actually in educational psychology, and even though I was groomed to be kind of a, a professor, I uh, <laughs> broke free from that path and have uh, been working as an independent consultant in kind of more what I call you know, applied research and evaluation. And so I help companies and nonprofits uh, look at the impact of various initiatives that they have, uh, some within uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but more broadly looking at um, how underrepresented youth uh, make their way through their career pathways. Um, most of my recent work has actually looked at underrepresented youth and STEM fields, um, but uh, as I mentioned before, or more broadly, just looking at how educational and work climates impact learning and achievement across the lifespan. Thank you. All right, I'm Diana Pan. I did not escape the <laughs> academia and teaching. Um, I am a I'm faculty in the Department of Sociology at Brooklyn College. I direct the American Studies program there. I'm also a, a faculty associate dean in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. I'm wearing many hats right now. Um, but my research, my work, primarily looks at the experiences of Asian Americans, primarily, but also Latinx, and individuals in what I call the elite professions, right? The, the ones attributed to the Ds. Um, the, um, uh, as attorneys, as physicians, and as um, professors. And um, so where did that start? Why is that interesting? Why did I even want to pursue that? Um, a little bit of backstory. So I'm a first generation college student, which means my parents did not go to college. Um, actually, very few people in my family went to college. I'm only the second person so far from both sides of my family, and I'm the only woman so far. So hoping my children, my daughters will, will break that trend. Um, I am a 1.5 generation immigrant, which means I came to this country when I was um, a young child. Um, I grew up in predominantly white Oregon, which meant I was uh, <laughs> very much marginalized, right? So what was interesting to me and what sociologists do, I don't know if any of you took sociology classes or were sociology majors, what we do is we like to study the exotic. So what was exotic to pe people who are educated in the professions, right? People who who, um, look like me and others, Latinx individuals in particular, in these professions. So here I am, right, studying exotic people in exotic spaces. Um, so yeah, and I am really delighted to share some of my, what I'm finding. 
Hi everyone. Um, my name is Dustin Ling. I've been at City for about 20 years. My day job is actually a banker uh, for our global public sector business. So I deal with governments and in particular supranationals like the UN or the World Bank. Um, a little bit about my background. I was actually born and raised in Aruba, the Dutch Caribbean. So as you know, the, the Chinese are everywhere in terms of um, the Chinese diaspora. Um, but that makes me very intersectional, um, meaning being born and raised in the Dutch Caribbean Caribbean. I'm Latino Caribbean. I'm also Dutch European. But my ancestry and history is also being um, Chinese American with very, very strong Asian American roots. I've been in the U.S. for 20 years. Um, and, and being in banking, as you can appreciate, for the past 20 years and two decades, you know, there's a certain profile when I started banking that looks like what a banker should be, often white, often male. Um, and especially in the front office, you see fewer East Asians or Asians. So I think it's been my passion to really be involved on aspects of diversity and inclusion with my colleagues. The other thing is also I'm also LGBT. So, you know, you know, code switching was very, very familiar to me, whether I'm Chinese as a Chinese American or as somebody who's from the LGBT community. Um, I'm also very involved in the industry as it relates to um, Ascend. I'm part of the Ascend Advisory Board in New York. I'm also part of the Committee of 100 um, Next Generation Leaders, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But for me, at, whether it's at city or in the industry, it really is about representation of AAPIs, which often, you know, in my firm and others, is really not considered underrepresented. And so this particular uh, group of um, employees that are quite loyal and represent 13% of the workforce don't make it to the executive level. And happy to speak more about those solutions you talked about. Amazing. Thank you all. Um, the thing you should take away is it's a highly qualified panel and we're going to have a really rich conversation. I'm, I'm going to ask my first question actually to you, Diana, and, and it's really timely just coming out of Joy's presentation where she dug into some of the tactics and what she's seen in her career on what is really holding back the advancement of AAPI talent. This is something that you've studied for many years. What would you add to what Joy shared? So I thought what um, Joy shared was a good place to start, right, for this conversation. I would argue that the overarching issue is culture. And I don't mean racial ethnic culture necessarily, right? I mean the culture of American society and professional spaces and professional culture, right, in the way that we are socialized, institutional culture. Because within these cultures and within these spaces, these institutions, are stereotypes ascribed to AAPIs, which Joy talked about, right? Such as, you know, um, being hard workers, but passive. Such as, you know, following directions, but not leadership material. The model might Minority image, which is actually rather pejorative and coined to put a wedge between black and AAPI communities, undermining this history of coalition building, which we could talk about if you're interested. Um, so then what happens then is these stereotypes are embedded, right, in how Asian Americans have been treated throughout history, but are reinforced also in the way that we see AAPIs in media, in our social, social, social media, printed media, right? Um, so these are kind of implicit in the way that we think and interact with Asian Americans. So are things changing? Maybe. Maybe. People are a little bit more aware, but do these controlling images change? That's something for us to think about, right? Because we all have controlling images in these implicit biases. But if supervisors and our peers hold on to these images, then they're less willing to recognize AAPI talent, right? And something else that Joy talked about as a corollary is that AAPIs may embody this imposter syndrome. It's really based on our socialization, right? Not just our socialization and our families, but our societal socialization, what we're expected to do. Okay, that's all part of our holistic socialization experience. Who are our role models, right? Who do we look up to? So this pipeline leak is then actually a result of internal identity negotiations as a result of that socialization and also external expectations, right? From American culture, society um, in total. So this this is rather quite a systemic issue, I would say. Julie, you run the Asia Society survey. What would you add from what you've seen from that from that data? Well, I need to correct you. Chris runs the survey. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> we'll talk after. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but uh, to kind of piggyback off of what uh, Diana was saying, that you know, have. Uh, 
uh, the challenges uh, changed and maybe uh, we often ask some of the similar questions over each iteration of the survey and one of the follow-up questions that we ask is about what are the biggest challenges that are affecting your professional growth and as someone who's looked at the you know, qualitative responses that come through that I can tell you that it hasn't changed dramatically over the entire decade that I've been looking at that uh, piece of information, which is a little bit disheartening and says we still have work to do, obviously. Um, but the themes that come through um, are, again, as what have been mentioned um, throughout the day, um, definitely looking at uh, struggles to gain visibility and recognition on kind of high-profile projects. Um, but in terms of looking at the variables that we assess on the survey, we really see advancement as kind of being a mix of uh, looking at the support for professional growth as well as um, reducing barriers and unconscious bias that exist in that promotion process. Um, and so it's really interesting because we asked our uh, survey respondents of those who are hoping to advance to uh, senior VP or um, higher levels within your company, do you actually expect it to happen? And what we found is that only 22% of our overall population kind of fell into that cluster. If we looked at just those who uh, were saying, yes, I definitely want to advance to those levels, uh, the number was closer to um, I think it was around 35 percent and there was a discrepancy um, by gender as well on how that played out. But the, the number was really tied very closely to another element that we looked at which is their perception of the equitable assignment of promotions at their company. So you know their expectations are based in the reality of what they're seeing within their company. So are, is there adequate representation at the board of director, directors level? within the executive management. And if they're not seeing that, that impacts obviously their own evaluation of whether or not that's likely to happen uh, within their own company, which of course is tied to satisfaction and commitment uh, and willingness to stay there. So it's all intertwined as well. Yeah, it's, it's a set of interconnected issues. I, I remember in 2019, um, we did some research into advancement, kind of similar to Julie, what you were describing. We also found that relative to other groups, when Asian American professionals didn't get a promotion, they were more likely to say, oh, it was because I wasn't ready, as opposed to because, you know, maybe there wasn't enough advocacy or sponsorship or the system kind of let me down or, or whatnot. And I think there's there's something around belief here, right, where if, if you don't believe that there's the potential for you to get to that next level, if you don't know the unspoken rules, right, what, what Joy referenced, um, you're less likely to kind of put yourself in a position where, you know, you can break through that bamboo ceiling, so to speak. I want to shift gears a little bit, um, Dustin, actually turn to you and, and talk. We talked a lot about the diagnosis of the challenge. You know, Joy, Joy spoke very eloquently on, on her, her views on that as well. But you're someone who's been at the forefront of the solutions, right, at City, at Ascend, um, in a lot of the work that you've done. What have you kind of learned along the way and, and what can we all take from that as we start to move towards the future we all want? Yeah, um, listen, I think um, having been at City and working with Ascend across different industries, I would say that this is not unique to banking or tech or government, right? I think we ha all kind of struggle with, um, you know, what we call the bamboo ceiling or the Asian glass ceiling. I think part of the, the learnings over the years has been what are you trying to solve for, right? Um, and I think often it, it is easy, an easy excuse, I think, to kind of fall back to we have the volume right? If you look at the numbers that are out there, Joy put it up as well, you know, you know, if you, the, the number is 20 million, right? 20 million really represents the Asian American population. Um, but that's 6% of the U.S. population. But the AAPIs are actually 13% of most workforces, right? 13%. So, but then when you measure the executive level, that's often half or less. And that's the aggregate number, right? That's the aggregate full definition of AAPI. And that full definition is South Asian, it's one third, one third, one third, right? South Asian, East Asian, and then also Southeast Asian. So that makes up 20 million and that makes up 13% of the, the workforce. So I think 
if you're going to talk about solutions, what are you solving for, right? And what are you measuring? Are you really measuring that? And I think part of it is really finding unity and strength in numbers in terms of the solution because you need South Asians, East Asians, and Southeast Asians to work together because we represent that number together. And that sometimes is a challenge, right? I mean, the four letter word AAPI represent 40 different countries, right? Uh, many, many different languages, different cultures, and how do you coalesce? Um, there's often, and I'll, I'll be very frank here, and, and some of you may be experiencing this, um, the words are, well, you're not underrepresented, right? Um, you know, so, so part of it is making sure that this very loyal part of the workforce is actually invested in just because we represent a, a number of them, are, are they really getting to that career path in terms of the bamboo ladder? Um, what, what we actually see in banking, I would say, is that you have 30 percent of the analyst class being Asian. And actually as they get, you know, advancing in, in throughout their career path, that number becomes actually smaller and smaller as they get promoted from analyst to associate to VP, director and MD. And they get stuck in the middle. And that's where we need to focus and say, what types of solutions do we have in terms of developing this population? And, and this is not to take away from un other dimensions of diversity. The LGBT community or the African American community or the Hispanic community should get all the resources that they deserve and need. But so should the AAPI community. So part of it, a part of the solution is finding unity as a, as a block, right, to advocate for what we need as a community. Um, having an AAPI strategy, this is quite basic, but you know, Nan and I talk about this all the time. What is our strategy? And we talk about the three prongs, clients, we talk about colleagues, and we talk about community. But what, do we have an AAPI strategy? Does your firm have an AAPI strategy? And that should include front to back your employees but also with your clients. That's part of sometimes the often the biggest part of the solution, finding a way to connect us to the client side. Yeah, I love this point about disaggregating the problem, right? Because, you know, it's the same at McKinsey, it's the same at many of the organizations that you're all part of. The answer isn't just we need more Asians in the company, right? It's across the different groups, it's a different challenge for East Asian women versus South Asian men, for Southeast Asian women, so on and so forth. And it's actually, I saw Ascend publish some research a couple weeks ago that showed that actually organizations that are among the most diverse in terms of overall representation tend to be the least diverse from a leadership representation standpoint, right? And the challenge, many of us were talking about this in the ERG breakout at lunch, is communicating that to non-Asian leaders at our organizations to say, you may look around and say overall Asian representation is X, but that doesn't get to the heart of the specific challenge that City faces or McKinsey faces or, you know, our other organizations face. Um, I want to stay on solutions and Julie, I want to turn to you because I know that um, the survey that Chris runs uh, also asks, you know, what are organizations doing to address the challenges that the survey diagnoses and what are some of the things that you've seen sure. people do? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, given that we're talking about measurable data, I'm going to make a plug for making uh, DEI metrics um, something that the companies are um, attaching accountability to. Uh, so really having uh, comprehensive dashboards and scorecards that aren't just looking at overall representation of AAPI employees uh, in general, but are looking at that from across uh, kind of the whole career pipeline. So looking at entry level, mid-level, and senior, uh, and being able to look at metrics that are in, uh, you know, looking at in depth at the promotion process as we've talked about, looking at turnover metrics, looking at salary metrics, but also just as importantly looking at perception data, uh, satisfaction um, of those employees. Uh, the struggle of course is being able to drill down into uh, meaningful uh, subgroups within the AAPI community, uh, especially for companies that are maybe uh, smaller in uh, scope in terms of their employee groups. So we get into issues with um, privacy concerns and, oh, can we really uh, attach our uh, self-ID data to our satisfaction survey data in-house and how do we work with that? But um, as I mentioned, one trend within the companies that seem to be getting this right are uh, really looking across, the, again, the career pipeline, looking at multiple metrics and doing their very best to kind of track that whole journey uh, in as nuanced as a way as possible. 
Dan, I'm going to come back to you. you. You mentioned in your intro, you know, you studied other groups, not just the Asian community. And I often think of us as kind of, you know, being newer to the diversity conversation. And we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't learn from the experiences of other groups, right, that have fought a similar fight over the years. Um, from your research, right, maybe with the Latinx community, what, what can we learn from those other groups? So I'd say in some ways Latinx professionals face um, similar issues as AAPIs, right? And that comes back to these implicit characteristics of leadership, right? How work are the controlling images work in those ways and what stereotypes might be holding one back. So the concern then as a society is that I'm going to get a little academic right, as we think about this, is we really only know one model of discrimination based on race or racism, right? What we've been taught, what we see in media, et cetera, is really the one model that targets black African Americans, right? And so in that way, it's um, with that recognition, it's easier to not only organize among black African American professionals, but there's also a recognition from colleagues, from superiors, et cetera, of implicit bias of discrimination based on race, right? But in reality, racism, I'm telling you this as someone who studies race, racism manifests in different ways for different racialized groups, okay? So if there's one lesson here, I want us to think about that. Racism manifest different, in different ways for different racialized groups. And that intersects with gender, with class, with sexuality, right, et cetera, et cetera. For, for um, AAPIs in particular, the bamboo ceiling, which we've talked about today, is a real phenomenon. And that in, is incessant with that of what we call microaggressions. And I'm not really sure what's so micro about microaggressions, right? But that's something that AAPIs will talk about and have experienced, especially in the professions. But microaggressions are a form of discrimination. If we see it as a pattern that happens to a particular group over and over and over again, well, the core definition of discrimination and, and discrimination based on race is repeated pattern, right? So that's one example of how that discrimination manifests. So advocacy for AAPIs, right, how it may be different than other groups such as um, black African Americans, it also takes educating. And that means educating our peers, our employers, and ourselves, right? Because the way that our society thinks are, are about discrimination is that APIs are hesitant to even describe our race-based discriminative interactions as such. I have so many respondents in my research who will talk about these repeated patterns of what's obviously race-based discrimination but stop, call, stop short of calling it racism. Right? So we need to educate ourselves in the racisms, right, that affect different um, groups. So I'm going to, you know, just put a plug in there. There's a whole field of Asian American studies. I don't know if anyone took any classes in Asian American studies, right, that engages with how Asians in the U.S. have experienced racism through laws, day-to-day -day interactions, systemic discrimination, and on and on and on. That really speaks to this um, group-specific um, experiences with discrimination. So it'll take some work to start naming them, and I do think we need to start naming them, right, as part of the advocacy. And we do, we do need to also learn, and that's part of the process. It's more emotional labor, right? It kind of adds on to more work, but, um, but if we want these cultures to change, we really need to do this work. Yeah, it also speaks to the diversity of, of, of our community. Right. I just as on a personal note, I'm not actually American. I'm Canadian. I don't know if there are Canadians out there, but um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and so I didn't grow up learning about the history of Asians in America. Right. I didn't know about the Chinese Exclusion Act. I didn't know about the building of the railway. I didn't know about the, the murder of Vincent Chin. Right. These were all things that for me were new, and I actually learned them after. Um, the Atlanta spa shootings, right? When our ERG took it upon ourselves to educate, to your point, Diana, the, the community. And there are people that are newer to the country than I am, right? Like I'm working with someone who, who came to the um, United States for grad school. He grew up in China and, and he probably knows even less about the history of, of Asians in America. And so it's, 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 it's the challenge of how do we kind of get on the same page and point in the same direction, right? Because the issues are the same whether or not um, you just got here, if you got here three generations ago, you, your face looks Asian, right? You, um, people won't be able to differentiate. I want to talk a little bit about ERGs. Um, 
Dustin, over lunch, it was interesting. We did a poll on what was the reason why you joined your, your group's ERG. Um, and you'll love this. The, the, the number one reason why people join their ERG, 54%, I wrote it down, um, was, was to be part of a community and kind of the social aspect of being part of an ERG. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I have had conversations separately um, about the broader mission of ERGs, right? And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how you see that at City and Beyond. Sure, sure. Um, listen, I mean, um, we all need to be, we're in a cultural institution today, so yeah. we, we all need to be very proud of our, our backgrounds, our history, our heritage, you know, whether you're Vietnamese or whether you're Korean or whether you're Sri Lankan. Um, you know, having been at City for, for a while and just seeing this in the industry, we revert to the easy stuff sometimes at the firm um, or wherever you may work. And that is food, that is Lunar New Year, that is Diwali. Lovely. Let's own it, love it, move on, ask for what we need. What do we need? We need advancement programs. We need development programs. The same programs that the majority gets invested in, as well as the underrepresented minorities, we are forgotten. We are forgotten. So that is where you need to lift your voices and ask for what you need. And that's what I mean also with the AAPI strategy. What's your strategy and what do you want? And to your point, it's very hard to ask 40 different subcultures to rep that represent API what they want. East Asians may feel that they need certain things and, and South Asians may feel that they don't need any, uh, something else, right? So part of it is getting on the same page on what the AAPI strategy is. Um, you know, I will, uh, let me share a little bit of a story around, you know, uh, our, our group that actually was created, which is Asian Leaders for um, Today, um, which is sort of an ERG adjacent, but it happened because of Asian hate, right? Because I think some people will respond, we want to be part of the ERG because it's social, we get to network f on the food stuff. But we, uh, there's a group of East Asians in particular, but Asians in general, that got together during Asian hate out of a very negative, bad situation. There are people within our community that were attacked in the subway, right? And it was really quite hurtful. So we created these brave or safe spaces to talk about that because people were afraid to get to work. But after a year of doing that, we wanted to stand up for the Asian hate issues, and this includes allies, but then we need to pivot and take that moment. Use that moment for, just like the African American community may have used the BLM moment, for our own moment and say, strike when the iron's hot, ask for what you need. Ask for the, so pivot to the positive, celebrate the Asians that actually have achieved those senior levels, but then where are the rest? Where's that pipeline? Have you invested in them? So pivot to the positive and actually ask for what you need as a community um, and using Asian hate as a moment and reflect on it and, and use that as part of the solution, right? Pivot that to a solution. And I think part of it is focusing on the Asian glass ceiling, which I spend a lot of time on, but it's also, it gets old, right? You want to talk about the bamboo ladder. Let's talk about the ladder. What is the ladder? How does it look like? What's the next level, right? So I think part of that is our journey at City. I think it's a journey of many organizations, and I think all of us can share. So if you want to talk to me or others, let's do that together as a community because it's not just within your own firm. It's not just within your dimension of diversity within the AAPI community, but it's also us working together as, as, a, as a community as a whole. Yeah, I also think ERGs have a real role even outside of our organizations to change society, yeah. right? Like I, I think about, um, I mentioned in my intro, like the things that McKinsey does, we do research, we do leadership development. These things are not by accident, right? These are things that people know McKinsey for and we're able to direct that energy towards issues where we can have disproportionate impacts. Someone at lunch who works at a healthcare company was sharing how they try to make a focus on health equity. Right? How do you make sure that in clinical trials, Asians are represented in the way in which we market our products, they're represented. Um, and I think for any company that you know, has TV commercials, how do we make sure that our community is represented in the faces that are on you know, the small screen and the big screen? Um, I kind of want to, at this point I've kind of gone off script, like I've gone through all the questions that I've written, so if people want to start asking questions, just to raise your hand, oh, we actually have a question. Um, I'll and I'll repeat it, so just, yeah, don't worry. The API community is so large, so differentiated, and yet what I'm hearing is that it's important to speak as one voice. How do you connect it to that kind of Really good question. So the question is, you know, we talked about how the community is so broad, so diverse. 
how do we speak as one voice? Anyone on the panel want to take that? I, I you know, I, I would just, I think, um, I would say a couple of things. How do we speak as one voice? I think uh, you're, you're right. I think I was just at a convention uh, two weeks ago for the Chinese American community and we were trying to figure out what is our message. But I think part of it is making sure that if you're at your organization, I go back to what's your AAPI strategy, right? Um, and defining that, right? And making it measurable, right? Um, is the strategy for that to address anti-Asian hate or is that strategy around advancement? And usually when you're talking about professional advancement, I think it's making sure that we are making measurable uh, progress in retaining Asians but then also um, advancing them up the chain to the C-suite. And, and, and again, 6% versus 13%, I mean, it, it, it's just not, it doesn't seem like it was, it's the right um, overall programmatic approach. So I think part of that is making sure that all of the dimensions of diversity within the AAPI community actually speaks as one voice for the advancement portion of it and measuring that. I mean, that's what I'm, from my perspective, that we should do as, as, a, as, a, as a team. I'm going to speak a little bit about the academic part right? If we think about this processes of racialization, these various e Asian ethnic groups have been racialized in the same way, right? In, or similar ways at least. The ways in which the first um, Chinese migrants came to the U.S., the uh, first Korean migrants, Japanese, Indian, et cetera, they're all due to labor, right? I mean, Asian Americans have been in this country since the 1500s. This is we're very, very much a part of U.S. history, right? Asian American history is U.S. history. And so the, the histories and the laws of racialization and how they have applied to Asian Americans have unites us, right, as one group in that way. Also strategically, I want to point back to, again, it's a little bit of a history lesson, but in the 60s and 70s, right, these various Asian ethnic groups came together. I'm not sure if we're all aware there was an Asian American movement, right, an Asian American civil rights movement that was really inspired by the black civil rights movement, right, and that really took strategically coalitioning together and really recognizing these um, similarities, which, you know, that Asian American movement, then we, there was an offspring of the yellow power movement, which my students are always very surprised by when they, they learn there was a yellow power, more militant um, movement. And more recently, I would point to the fact that these xenophobic racist attacks on Asian Americans, right, xenophobia has been kind of the experiences of Asian Americans since um, our beginnings here in this country. Right? So if we look to our current attacks on Asian Americans, which is not really, I mean, it's fizzed a bit, but not really. We just don't see it in um, mainstream media anymore. People are still being attacked. Um, but there was no ethnic discrimination on that. Right? People who were Vietnamese or Chinese or, you know, um, Filipino, there was no discrimination because the way we were, we are racialized, right? It was an equal opportunity attacks that were happening. So I would, I would argue, right, we are racialized, right, by our society and by history, and that gives us the platform by which to organize um, together. Yeah, I would add one thing, which is, you know, some of you may have seen Taft's status report that came out a couple weeks back, and like the one thing from that report that really stuck out to me was upwards of two-thirds of Americans feel that Asian Americans are more loyal to their country of origin or are unsure whether or not that's the case. And I think to your point, Diana, the othering of the Asian American community is consistent regardless of which subsegment. Right, at that same summit, we talked a lot about how there's a parallel between what's happening with the Chinese American community now and what happened with the Muslim American community after 9 11. And I think there are moments where um, we have to be nuanced, right, when we think about our ERG strategies and helping different groups and the different needs that they have. But there are other moments where we really have to come together as a community because we realize that these challenges are not unique, right, to the Chinese American community or the Sikh American community or, or, or what have you. Um, and then that, that kind of holding both of those views, I think, is essential. 
Um, any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'm going to... Uh, we have a question from the audience. Is that um, Santa? Hello. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, so I am speaking very hypothetically. This is something that I think can resonate with people. Um, I've spoken to many people at the conference and Asian uh, employee networks, and one thing they discuss is, you know, we see the data and we hear diversity and inclusion programs saying they look at the data... The Asians are doing fine. They're doing okay. Uh, they look at the comparison compared to other groups, and they say, well, they're doing okay. Look at where the Asians are relative to uh, the, the rest of the other underrepresented groups. So my question is to you, how do you respond to demonstrate that Asians are not invisible, that it's not about being okay, and what would be the right response when you hear those types of comments? I, I'd love to start on this one. I, I would say that you know, that perception is fundamentally untrue. Right? I would say we published a report in September last year, Asian Americans in, in, in the workplace, that showed that while Asian Americans socioeconomically on average do very, very well, we're actually the least diverse group in terms of socioeconomic outcomes when you look across the difference between East Asians, South Asians, Southeast Asians, the different countries of origin, and when you look at kind of the diversity of jobs that our community holds, right? Most of us in this room work in tech, professional services, finance, others. We are in some ways the model minority, but the reality is in New York City, 25% of Chinese New Yorkers live in poverty. That's higher than the average, right? And I, and I think that, you know, in these conversations, and I know it's a hypothetical, you're often speaking to someone who only knows Asians like the Asians in this room. And our community is so much broader and more diverse than that. And so, you know, one thing I would say is the, the, the data, when you can communicate it in that nuanced way, really answers the question for that person that's asking the question. Yeah, uh, and I would, I would come back on that one as well. I think there's a fallacy in that statement. The fallacy is you're comparing it to the other minority groups. You should be comparing that number with the majority. Yeah. Full stop. I mean, it's very clear. So, so this is not a competition with the other dimensions of diversity. As I mentioned, they should be getting every aspect of resources, budget, technology, you know, et cetera, HR support, DEI support, that they deserve. It is very typical of actually pitting against the model minority with everybody else. In the, in, in, that, that are minorities. So to me, there's a fallacy in that statement overall. It's often used, Sana. I, I, it's often used. That's one. The other one is we got a lot of South Asians in CEO level jobs, or we got 30% of Asians coming in the door. Did you check on them as they were going through their career waiting for their promotion? No, you didn't. So I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty like, let's call BS a little bit on this as well and use the facts and numbers as they should be. Right. Hello. We have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, just, go for just it. Just to follow up on that, and I suppose just providing the the corporate reality, I suppose, because going to my CEO and, and diversity leads and having those conversations, they're looking at it from a, and I'll use America as an example where you've got those diversity statistics, they're looking at it from a perspective of, okay, we are based in Silicon Valley. What is the population like in Silicon Valley? What is our employee population like based in Silicon Valley? It all looks okay, and generally it's black and Latino X is underrepresented, so that's where we'll allocate budget and resource. So to then go, okay, but look at the majority of white people and do it, they don't care. Well, not that they don't care, but the, the resource is allocated in reality to where it's perceived as needed. They don't care. So, so uh, what I would say on that is, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking within a, a not cone of silence. I mean, I think I'd, I'd say this pretty uh, outwardly anywhere, but I think I'm pre speaking a lot more candidly because this is our community, right? Um, I totally agree with you. I think part of this is having finesse in terms of how you articulate this. The other thing I would do, I would say, is that the AAPI community has the biggest opportunity to link this to a business case. With, you know, it's harder to do that on the Hispanic or underrepresented minority, uh, African American or LGBT side. There's a huge business case on the business on, as a, on the business side. So your ERG should be BRGs. They should be business um, employee resource groups, right? And and that is 
connection to, to Asia, connection to growth in Asia, uh, connection to clients that are Asian who are your CFOs or CEOs that are in positions of power. So part of that is having finesse and how you articulate it to bring along not just the colleague employee side but then also the client angle is my recommendation. I'm looking at the clock. It looks like we have maybe like 45 seconds left. I, I want to give everyone on the panel one more opportunity with a closing thought. Um, and if you don't have a specific thought, maybe a piece of advice for those in the audience that are maybe starting out in their careers. Um, Dustin, I'm going to start with you and then we'll go to Diana and then Julie, you can close things out. Sorry, what's the question done? Just advice? A, a closing thought or a piece of advice for the audience? Um, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a plug. I'm, I'm part of the Committee of 100, which is, is just recently we created a public good. Um, and that public good, um, and, and no offense to the researchers and the academics, um, we as Asians love data, right? So um, we love white papers, and we've done a lot of white papers, and McKinsey has done a white paper, BCG did one, Columbia did one on Chinese Americans. But we created this public good, which is really a Vox style video that's four and a half minutes talking about the Asian glass ceiling. I'm going to send it to you, ask me for it. Yeah, I'm probably going to put it on LinkedIn very soon. But it synthesizes basically what the Asian glass ceiling is, not just for us. And it's called the 20 million project because that's 20 million is us, right? So, um, that, so part of it is nobody's going to read a 100 page you know, white paper on the, the bamboo ceiling. So we created this digitally native um, production and put it on YouTube. And, and really it, it articulates a foundational story that we can tell for ourselves because many of us don't know that 20 million is our number, which is, you know, interesting. But then also using it with um, non-Asians. Because if we can articulate our own message with the, own, with the facts and how we're divvied up uh, as four, 40 different kind of subcultures in this AAPI definition and the, the ceiling that exists, then why would the white male understand that? So anyway, I, I, I suggest if, if you're interested, please speak to me or I can share with you. Um, uh, you know, really telling that story. Part of it is telling our stories with facts, but telling our, telling our stories as really human beings that are Americans that, but then are also happen to be Asian as well. All right. I'm just going to um, recommend that you continue to advocate if you haven't, right? Advocate within your own entities, but also think more broadly. And I, I'm speaking on um, a school pa a panel for, for youth later this evening, and um, it's the same issue. It's the same issues in visibility, the model minority. It starts plaguing us from a young age, right? So the advocacy needs to start younger. Yes, advocate within our own entities, but also it, with school boards, of school boards, with um, educators, right? What type of curriculum are they offering? Are they teaching these things? Because we need to change institutional cultures in order to be, in order to recognize how we can, de the, you know, the need to disaggregate the data, the need to look at particular numbers. I mean, as um, Asian said earlier, you know, the, the most impoverished group in New York City is actually an Asian American ethnic group, right? But we don't know this because we don't think about Asian Americans in that way. So we need to advocate in all realms of um, our lives. Well, final thought, I have to make a plug for the annual report of the survey and just let you know that the, the subtitle is focused on ERGs and seeing that as a connecting thread across positive outcomes. But in the uh, spirit of doing drill down, I wanted to just kind of connect back to what Dustin said that, you know, ERGs when they're leveraged in a way that's more of a, a BRG, so they're seen as a resource for strategy within the company, we're finding that that is really what pushes a, a, an ERG to a new level in terms of the impact uh, that it has for employees uh, across many outcome areas. So. And in fact, people who are active members in their ERGs, if it's a, not a highly leveraged ERG and maybe it's mostly focused on cultural um, activities, uh, those tend to be the least satisfied employees within the company. So they're very active, but they're not seeing a lot of impact of being involved. So really looking at the quality of what the ERGs are doing and how the senior leadership are leveraging that to uh, address client needs and employee needs alike. 
It's a great place to end. ERGs is BRGs. Well, Julie, Diana, Dustin, real pleasure. Um, thank you for joining me on this panel. Thank you all for being a fantastic audience. Um, we're going to turn things back over to Martin.